Good day, grade 12, grade 10, sorry. Welcome to this next science lesson. In this lesson, we're going to carry on learning about vectors and scalars. We actually started this last lesson and we spoke about the fact that everything we measure can be divided into two groups, which are your scalars and your vectors. A scalar, remember, is a physical quantity that has magnitude only, whereas a vector has got both magnitude and direction. And we started speaking about the different types of scalars and vectors, and then we got to the end of the lesson. So let's just talk about this again. We spoke about the distance when the path actually traveled, whereas displacement is basically the shortest distance from point A through to point B. Okay. Um, mass is measured in kilograms and weight is the force that attracts you to the planet you're on. Now, this speed is distance over time, whereas velocity is displacement over time. And I was busy explaining to you the fact that this year would be your distance. Okay, your distance is, say, for example, you decided to take a windy path to get from point A to the flower at point B, whereas displacement is how far you actually are from where you started. Okay, displacement is how far you are from where you started. Speed is a measure of distance over time. So you'd measure the full distance traveled divided by time. So this would be in meters per second, for example, but there wouldn't be any direction. Okay, whereas yeah, we'd have displacement is how far we actually traveled from where we started okay, in a straight line. So it would also be in meters per second, but there'd be a direction. So in this case, it might be, um, what would that be? If we read this off, this would be north, south, west, and east. So maybe this would be five degrees north of east, okay? Time, as you know at the moment, as far as we know, we cannot travel back in time. So therefore, it is a scalar and the SI unit for it is seconds. And the abbreviation for seconds, the unit for seconds is S, not sec. Okay, not sec. There's a very sad joke that goes around that the teachers make that there's no sex in science. Okay, so no sec only s okay acceleration is velocity the change in velocity over the change in time which is why it's a vector so it kind of works like this displacement is a vector right because displacement is a vector velocity is a vector because velocity is displacement over time therefore acceleration is a vector because acceleration is velocity over time so acceleration is measured in meters per second squared and again you need direction and finally the other scalar that you may come across or will come across is electric charge which is measured in coulombs measured in coulombs right so let's talk a little bit more about vectors because although in up to now, we've mainly spoken about scalars. Now we're going to be start working out with vectors. So we represent vectors using an arrow. The arrow tells us how big the vector is and the direction of the vector. So you need to realize that the bigger the arrow, the bigger the vector. Okay, and the shorter the arrow, the shorter the vector. Right. There are three ways to represent the direction of a vector quantity. The one is a compass, the other one's bearings, and the third one is the direction of the vector relative to another vector. So what do we mean when we talk about compass? We're actually talking about the four points of the compass. So it is north, south, west, and east. Okay, we always assume that the top of the page is north unless they tell us otherwise. Unless they tell, I'm sorry, I have to sneeze. Just hold on for a second. I'm so sorry, this um, cold is just lingering. I did take drugs 
I mean medication, but it didn't, it doesn't seem to have taken hold yet. Okay, so when we say campus, we're talking about the four points of the campus, which is north, south, west, and east. And when we are talking about our vectors, we're talking about it with respect to the four cardinal points of the campus. So for example, this would be written as three degrees north of east. Okay, you generally, you could write this as 60 degrees east of north, um, but generally what we do is that if it's on this side of, okay, so if this is the 45 degree line, if it's on this side of the 40 degree, 5 degree line, then we refer to it with respect to north, and if it's on this side of the 45 degree line, then we do, we refer to it with respect to east, okay, so in this case, this is 30 degrees north of east, but you could get away with calling it 60 degrees east of north, Another vector, V2, would be again 30 degrees east of south. 30 degrees east of south. So you can see how we refer to it with respect to the, the compass and I mean the points of the compass. And I've spent a while teaching my students that you need to realize that it's no use saying, oh, well, that's east ish. Okay, east ish. Because <laughs> Let's say you are sailing and you are, okay, yes, the earth, right? Very small version of the earth, okay? Very squished version. And here is, and I'm going to tell you again that I really cannot draw to save my life. But here is, I don't know, Africa. And over here somewhere is America, South America. It's over there somewhere, okay? Right, so now you head off. Okay, now admittedly this is going west. But you say, okay, I'm going to head off west-ish. West-ish. So west-ish goes down, yeah, somewhere. Okay, you could end up, now that doesn't look like a big deal, but because this is so far away, you could end up, at the southern tip of South America when you actually want to be up here in the middle of South America or the further part in South America. So traveling east-ish or south-ish is not going to help. You have to be very, very specific, okay, especially when we're talking about long distances. Another example, which might be a little bit easier for you to visualize, especially with my drawings, is let's say we are traveling from Cape Town which is over here, to Joburg and Pretoria, which is kind of like over here. So if I say, okay, fine, and let's pretend that this is north, south, west, and east, and I say, okay, fine, I'm going to go northeast, exactly northeast. If I travel exactly northeast from Cape Town, I miss Joburg. Oh, that's not perfectly. Hang on a minute. Um... I miss Joburg, I miss Pretoria, I miss everybody, okay, here we go, so there we go, I miss them entirely, I end up up here in Mozambique, okay, so really you guys have to be careful about your angles, right, so, sorry about that, the other options are bearings, so what they do is, and you mustn't get confused between trigonometry and science and geography. Trigonometry, just to remind you so that you can think about it, goes 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360. Remember that's the class diagram, it's all stations to Cape Town, okay, the class diagram. That starts 0 over here. With science and geography, we start north up here, right? And then what we do is we can keep on that's north, south, east, and west. And we go clockwise. So north is north degrees and south is 180 degrees. And then east is obviously 90 and west is 270. And I don't know if you've ever seen, but on the runways at airplanes, they, I mean at airfields, they have these numbers and they might have, for example, on the runway, at the end of it, you'll see a big 180 on that side and then big zero on this side. And over here, if they have exactly a crossways, 
runway, it would be on a 90 or 270. They might say this is 270. Okay, what they are telling you is that that runway runs from north to east. Um, and they will also call it runway 180, which is telling you that it's running from north to east. So it depends on the direction of the prevailing wind as to which way the runways are going to be set. But obviously, ideally, you'd want to run. So it's no use running a, a, a 180 runway from north to south if your prevailing wind is from west to east for the simple reason that I don't know if you know this, but you need to take off into the wind and land into the wind. OK, so there we go. But anyway, so when we're talking about bearings, instead of relating things to the cardinal points, we're just talking about going from naught all the way around to 360. So for example, this one here is on a bearing of 60 degrees because of the fact that it is 60 degrees clockwise from north. Whereas this one here, which before was 30 degrees west of south, okay, is now on a bearing of 210 degrees. And how did they get that? Well, the whole of this is 180 degrees. And we know that this little bit here is 30 degrees. And what's 180 plus 30 is 210 degrees. And a lot of times when you're flying, you will hear them say on a bearing of, okay? It's easier for people to handle bearings than to try and work out where east of south is or west or north or whatever. So in each of the following cases, these cases, yeah, the relative angle is 30 degrees. In other words, vector A is 30 degrees away from vector B. Vector A is 30 degrees, and if we had to measure this angle, it would be 30 degrees. So this talks about the direction of the vector relative to another vector. Please note, this is very important, direction of the vector is always measured at the tail of the vector. So we tend to use this as, let's say for example, we have got a log and we've got two boys and they're both pulling the log, okay? Here is boy A and here is boy B and they're both pulling the log. Now I don't care, there's a rope around the log, I don't care if they are going north, south, east or west. If I want to see what the result in the force is, I need the angle between these two boys, which is going to be, for example, 20 degrees. Okay, just an example. So then I can start working out the resultant of the two boys' forces on the log. So this is really where we use these, when we don't care about where they fit in with the rest of the world. 30 degrees, 30 degrees. Okay, so now that we've spoken about vectors and scalars, we're going to put it into practice and we're going to start by looking at motion in one dimension. Okay, so first of all, we've already spoken about distance versus displacement, where distance is the actual distance or path length covered by the option. And guess what, guys? you need to learn this definition. It's very important. Displacement is a magnitude and direction of a straight line drawn from the starting point to the end point of motion. So remember again how I drew this and I said, okay, fine, let's pretend that this is a tree. Okay, and this, oh, and this is, I don't know, a butterfly, and it's flying to the tree, point A to point B. This year, the straight line that goes from point A to B is the vector, okay? It is the displacement. It is telling me the exact distance that the, the fly or the butterfly flew from point A to point B. The fact is, if you've ever watched a butterfly fly, it doesn't fly like that. It flies like this. La 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 And then back there, okay? So you can see that the distance, the distance, which is the actual path length, 
is usually a lot longer than the displacement. So the distance is the scalar and it's the actual distance of path length covered, whereas the displacement is the magnitude and the direction. So in this case, again, we'd give a bearing. We would say, well, that looks like about 89 degrees. So we'd say it is so many meters at a bearing or on a bearing of 89 degrees. Okay, so you always have to give a direction when we're talking displacement. Speed, as we've discussed before, is a rate at which distance is covered. So speed is equal to distance over time. The SI unit for distance is meters. The SI unit for time is seconds. Therefore, the unit is meters per second. And you will notice that we don't, because distance is a scalar, speed is going to be a scalar as well. Whereas velocity is the rate at which displacement is covered. So velocity equals displacement over time. But now, which is also meters over seconds, which is meters per second, negative one. But displacement is a vector. And a vector divided by a scalar gives us a vector. Just for interest sake, a vector multiplied, oopsie, sorry, let's try again. I'm still busy writing vector, that's why. A vector multiplied by a scalar also gives us a vector. Okay, do you understand that? So a vector times a scalar gives a vector, and a vector divided by a scalar is a vector. So therefore, there has to be direction. We have to give direction. So let's go through two exam type questions. Well, they are exam questions. Uh, with respect to vectors and scalars and, and displacement and distance and speed and velocity and then once we've done that we can talk some more about um, motion one dimension so this is a multiple choice question that comes out of old exam paper question set by the government it says which one of the following displacement vector diagrams will have the greatest resultant Okay, so do you agree that this has a resultant of exactly one meter? Resultant, remember, is basically saying how far we are. It's the sum of all the vectors. Okay, the resultant is the sum of all the vectors. Okay, now this is pushing it a little bit because we haven't quite learned about adding vectors yet in these lessons, but I want you to just use the logic. Okay, do you agree that over here, from here to here, we're going to be one meter away from where we started? Okay, so that's one meter. From here, we're going to go up and across and down. So actually, do you see that we are still one meter away from where we started. Yeah, we go up, across, down, and back. So therefore, we have a zero displacement. Whereas this, if we had to use Pythagoras, because this is obviously at 90 degrees, if this is one and this is one, what is this going to be? Let's think about it. It is one squared plus one squared square rooted. That's what's equal to this, right? which is going to be the square root of two, which is bigger than one. Okay, bigger than one. So therefore, the biggest resultant is going to be this. And even if you couldn't work it out, do you know that this is the hypotenuse of a right angle, which is always bigger than the other two sides. So you didn't even have to work it out. You just knew that that was the longest side, which is more than one. So therefore, B is the correct answer. Right, now let's look at this question. I actually really like this question because it really gives you an idea of the distance, difference between distance and displacement, okay? It says car racing is very popular in South Africa. Many young people want to test the speed of their cars and meet regularly at racetracks. An oval ra racetrack has a displacement, okay, wait, just let me 
do something here quickly. I just want to get as far as this and I want to make this bigger so we can see a bit better. Okay, there we go. It's much better. So it says an oval racetrack has a lap distance of 2,000 meters. So if we start here and go all the way around, that's 2,000 meters, right? The car has to complete five laps, five laps. It says what distance will the car have covered at the end of the five laps? Well, do you agree each lap is 2,000 meters, but then we're doing five laps. So we're going to go 2,000 times by five, which is 10 thousand meters. So the distance of cars will have traveled was 10,000 meters. Now it says what will the displacement of the car be from the starting point after completing the five laps? Well if you think about it, what is displacement? Displacement is how far we are from where we started. Okay, and do you agree that we would start here and go around once and then twice Okay, get the gist. So at the end of the first lap, we are back to where we started. Ditto at the end of the second lap, ditto for the end of the third lap. So do you see that for all five laps, we end up back where we started? So the displacement is zero, a big fat zero. Right. Now it says, in one of the races, a car has a running start. Okay, in other words, it's already going when it starts. The timekeeper starts the stopwatch as the car passes the starting point. The results are shown in the table below. So it says, on the graph paper attached, this was the graph paper, draw a graph of the number of laps on the dependent y-axis. This is number of laps, okay, and versus time in seconds. So the number of laps is going to be one, two, three, four, and five. And we're going from 55 to 400 effectively. So do you agree it's going to be 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, uh oh, 350, oh, thank goodness, 400. Okay, so that works. Right, now remember grade 10, so what you really need to do is Hmm, interesting. Um, what you need to do is always remember to do, draw your graph. Sorry, what I was reading was it says plot the points and connect them with straight lines, which is interesting because normally you get asked to draw the best fit line. Okay, so that's a bit different. And then it says also supply suitable heading, which we'll do in a bit. But do you see that what we are looking at is a graph and what you really need to do is remember to draw it in pencil in case we make a mistake. Okay, so number of laps, the first number of laps is one, and the time is 50 seconds. Okay, so this goes 50, 100, that means every second of these is 60, so this is 55 there, and I'm going to draw little crosses, otherwise thing has a nervous breakdown. At two, it's 110, at three, it's 165, so it's 150, 160, 165. At four, it's 275, so it's 250, 260, 275. And at five, it's 385, so at five, it is 385, so that's 350, 360, oh sorry, 360, 370, 385. And what's interesting is that normally you get asked to draw a best fit line, but in this case they've asked you to connect the dots with straight lines. So they actually want us to draw straight lines. Now guys, if you've got a ruler and your ruler helps you to see that, so for example, these three all have the same gradient, then that's wonderful. Um, in fact, they do. So these three are one straight line. 
okay and then you can see that it changes um, and there we go right so feel free to use your ruler when you are drawing these especially if they ask you to draw a straight line but otherwise you should not use a ruler and you should draw it with your free hand to get best fit adding a super suitable headline is very easy it is number of laps versus the time taken there you go that's how easy this is now it says that's 5.3 now it says use your graph to determine how long the car took to complete 2.2 laps okay indicate on your graph how you obtain this value so we want to know approximately how long it took to do 2.2 laps okay so it took this amount of time to do two laps and that amount of time to do three laps so do you agree 2.2 let's just have a look that's 2.1 2.2 no each one of these is a one so 2.2 is over here so we're going to go dish 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 across dish 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 and then we're going to go down dish 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 and we can see that it took approximately 125 seconds and it says indicate on your graph how you obtain this you need to draw in your dotted lines to show what you did to get the answer now it says calculate the average speed for the five laps the average speed for the five laps so do you agree we've got the time okay and we've got the distance we know that the distance traveled the distance traveled for the five laps was what we worked it out okay let's go back and see it was 10,000 meters so 10,000 meters is the distance traveled. We also know the time it took to travel those five laps was 385 seconds. There is the time it took to travel five laps. So do you agree that the speed is just the distance divided by the time, which is going to be 10,000 divided by 385 okay so now let's get out a calculator so it's 10 1 2 3 divided by 385 and that comes to 25,974025. and the reason i'm giving you all these numbers is to show you that we always need to round up to two decimal places Two decimal places and therefore we need to look at the third one and this third one is a four which means that this is rounded down so it's going to be 25 comma nine seven meters per second and because we're working at speed we don't have to worry about direction right now it said how does the motion of the car during the first three laps compare with its motion during the last two laps okay so do you see that over here okay over here this gradient is quite steep and that is the number of laps per time okay but do you agree the number of laps actually looks at distance so i think that i could say well since this gradient is much deeper than the second part that this is faster this is faster so if it asks me, how does the motion of the car during the first three laps compare with its motion during the last two laps? I would say the motion of the car during the first three laps is faster than the motion of the car during the last two laps. And why? Because the gradient is steeper. Okay. In other words, they're doing more laps for the same amount of time. Right, now let's talk about adding vectors. And the first thing we're going to talk about is adding vectors in the same plane so it's the same direction the same one dimensional 1d adding okay so 
The best way to add vectors is to draw out your vectors. It says a girl walks 12 meters east and then a further 14 meters east. So first of all, we need to choose a direction as positive. So let's choose east as positive, okay? Then what do we do? Right, now, you can either draw this using scale diagrams or you can just think about it logically. A girl walks 12 meters east, so she starts here and she walks 12 meters east. And you really should use a ruler to draw this, guys. Then she works, walks a further 14 meters. Now remember, 14 is bigger than 12, so this vector should be slightly longer. So that's 14 meters. So what is her resultant? It's going to be all the way from here to here. So do you agree that the total resultant is going to be 26 meters east? East. Okay, 26 meters east. Remember, since we're talking about vectors and displacement, you have to give a direction. Now it says a young man walks 18 meters west and then 9 meters east. Can I find his displacement? Okay, so again, we start with the man and we're going to choose west as positive. So let me just erase where we're at. Okay, so he walks 18 meters west. Okay, there's his 18 meters. He then realizes he's forgotten something or something and he walks back nine meters. So what is his resultant? Do you agree his resultant, his resultant is going to be nine meters west. How far is we from where he started? He's nine meters away from where he started in the westerly direction. Now, remember I said we need to choose something as positive and negative. The reason being, if we had to add this, okay, we've been doing this using vector diagrams. Let's say we had to add this algebraically. The first one would be 12 plus 14, which would just be 26 meters in the original direction, which is east. In this case, what do we have? This is positive, but remember that we've said that if west is positive, then east must be negative. So what we're saying is that it's going to be 18 plus minus 9, which is the same as 18 minus 9, which is 9 meters west. Okay, and why is it west? Because it's positive and we chose west as positive. Whoopsie. So a definition of a resultant vector or resultant force. A resultant is a single vector that has the same effect as the original vectors taken together. Okay, in other words, if we add up all the other vectors together and replace it with a single vector, that is a resultant. Okay. Now let's talk about adding vectors in 2D. So when the vectors are not in a straight line, there are two other methods we can use to add the vectors. The one is triangle method and the other is a parallelogram method. Um, now, traditionally, I need to tell you that originally the parallelogram method was in the curriculum, but now it is no longer in the curriculum. So what they do is um, if they, don't, they can't ask you to um, they can't ask you to do something with with the actual with the actual parallelogram method, but it might be your choice to use the parallelogram method instead of um, using the triangle method. I personally think the triangle method is easier. Okay, so let me tell you about the triangle method versus the parallelogram method. The triangle method is called the head to tail or the tail to head method, depending on whose textbook you are looking at, okay? So, the magnitude and direction of the result is obtained by drawing a straight line from the tail of the first vector to the head of the second vector, okay? So let's say, for example, there's a guy, and let's say he walks, I don't know, five meters north, 
and then he walks three meters east. And I want to know what is his resultant, okay? So using the head to tail method, what I would do is I would draw an arrow. I would say, okay, fine, he's obviously starting there. That's his start point. He's now traveling five meters north. So he's going up, and yes, you need to use a ruler, five meters in the northerly direction, right? Then he travels what? He travels three meters east. So he travels three meters east, and that's a 90 degrees, and that line's too long because it has to be shorter than the five meters because it's only three meters. So it's three meters east, okay? And they want to know what is my resultant. So do you agree that that is my resultant? The resultant is how far I am from where I started, okay? So this would be the head to tail or tail to head method. The reason they're calling it that is because when you look at your arrow, this here is the head, the head of the arrow, and this bit here is the tail of the arrow. So this is head to tail or, okay? But now the resultant is interesting because the resultant is always, always, head to head and tail to tail. It's always that head to head and tail to tail, right? Now, if we want to work out this resultant, what can we do? We can use Pythagoras, right? We can say, okay, fine, R squared is equal to five squared plus three squared which is going to be 25 plus 9, which is going to be 34, which is R squared. Therefore, R is going to be the square root of 34, which is, hang on, square root of 34 equals 5.83 meters. We have been finished because we need to find the angle, okay? So I will talk to you more about finding the angle and finding the direction when we get to that page. But at the moment, you need to realize that we've almost finished, but we still need to work out the direction. But this is the triangle or head to tail method. Now, the different method is the parallelogram method. Yeah, they take the magnitude direction into account that two vectors are drawn from the same point. Okay, and this is called the tail-to-tail -tail method. The parallelogram is then completed by drawing dotted construction lines and the result is then diagonal. Okay, very well. Okay, fine. But let's say, for example, again, that we have... Um, okay, it might be easier to visualize it if you have this. Let's say, for example, we are hanging a fish up that we've, we've caught. We're hanging a fish up to dry. Okay, here's our fish, and we're hanging it up to dry. No, that's not going to work for us at all. Okay, let's forget I said that. Let's say, for example, we have got a log. Okay, here is our log. And we've got John pulling the log. And we have got James pulling the log. Okay. And I tell you that John is pulling the log with 50 newtons. And James is pulling the log with 20 newtons. And I tell you that the angle between them is 30 degrees. And I want to know what is the resultant force on this vector, what is, I mean on this log, what is the resultant? Okay, so if we think about it, we have a point, we have John pulling this at 15 newtons, and we've got James pulling this, not quite so long. James pulling this at 20 newtons. And the angle between them is 30 degrees. Now, to complete the parallelogram, what we do is we take an another side, we draw the other side, this side, which is parallel to this. So it's going to be parallel to this, okay, and the same length. So it's going to be parallel 
and the same length. Let me just see three fingers more or less. That's the same length. OK, let's see if I can erase a little bit of it. I don't know if I will. Yeah, yeah, I can. OK, then what we do is we join it up. So this line should be parallel to that line. So this is now parallel to this and this is parallel to this. Obviously, I'm drawing this by hand, so it's not that easy. Then my resultant will be this. My resultant will be that. And then obviously we have to work out um, the angle from north. Okay, so this is the parallelogram method. Now let's talk about, oops, sorry. Now let's, uh, let's not. Okay, we will start here on this part where we will talk about finding the length of the side. We've already shown you how to use Pythagoras, but we'll show you again. And then using Sakatoa, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Great Tense, for joining me, and I look forward to teaching you some more stuff in the next lesson. Have a great day.